I am Beth Bradley. I work at the El Paso Zoo in El Paso, Texas. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Raw Safari Podcast. Y'all, I love the people that listen to this podcast so much. And um, if you've listened to the entire Podcaster Summit episode that uh, I did recently um, with the lovely uh, co-hosts of uh, Mothering Wildlife and the NEI Tech Talk podcast, uh, Elizabeth and Chris, then you know that at one point I talked about how interesting it is hearing from all of the different people who listen, because everyone kind of has their own perspective on who I am and what the podcast is, and uh, it, it's very interesting to see. And I, I'm rehashing that because um, this episode starts with one of those stories, actually a story I told in that episode, uh, when I got an email from Beck Bradley. Now, Beck works at the El Paso Zoo, and they are a listener, and they had a story that they wanted to share with everyone who listens to the podcast. And uh, when they emailed me, it just started off with, I'm sure you get a million of these emails a day. And y'all, I do not. But it tickled me so much. And then I, I read the, the pitch that Beck had for me. And uh, you know what? It was an awesome thing that I want to share on the podcast. And now you're going to get to hear that interview. Uh, so I'm really grateful that Beck reached out. And I'm really grateful to get to do this episode. So way back at the start of the podcast, my fourth episode was Remembering Iggy. And I really haven't had a chance to do an episode quite like that since. It is literally an episode where we spent the entire time talking about one animal, her life, her death, etc. Well, the, the the stories that Beck wanted to share uh, are about two animals. Two Asian elephants that they worked with at the El Paso Zoo are the entire tale of this episode. Mm -hmm. Except y'all know me, and I really like to get philosophical now. And Beck and I actually have a really amazing conversation before we specifically get into these two elephants. Uh, that I think you'll really appreciate. But then, man, when we tell you the tales of Savannah and Juno, the elephants, y'all get ready to have your hearts filled and broken and swelling with pride and just all the things. These two animals, while both being Asian elephants, have incredibly different stories. And uh, each one of them is absolutely going to tug at your heartstrings. I love these stories. The heartbreaking part to me is that they're gone now. And so I can't go and meet Savannah and Juno and, and interact with them in person because y'all, Beck made me fall in love with them and they're going to make you fall in love with them too. And that is almost unfair. <laughs> no, I kid. I kid. It's amazing. And to be able to share the story of two incredible, beautiful elephants with all y'all is such an honor and a privilege to me. It's also a privilege to have the El Paso Zoo on for the first time. I love getting new facilities, and I love that we're in a string of new facilities on the podcast right now. So uh, I hope you all enjoy what you hear. A uh, couple of quick reminders. Make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss any episodes of the podcast. Make sure you're following along on socials at Rossafari and on TikTok at Rossafari Pod. And 
don't forget that I do have a Patreon where you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. And sometimes you'll get bonus uh, content from episodes like this one. There is some patron exclusive audio from this episode. And uh, yeah, even more time spent talking with Beck. So here it is. Get ready to uh, have your heartstrings tugged, y'all. This is my interview with Beck Bradley of the El Paso Zoo. I am a zookeeper in Area 1, which is pachyderms and hoofstock, mostly. Nice. A pachy stock keeper. I like it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. And um, so, you know, I, I like to start with a little bit of a history of the, the, the person involved normally. But in this case, you actually reached out to me. And so why, why are we here to chat today? Today, we're here to chat about the two loves of my life, um, Juno and Savannah. Um, they both have since passed on. Um, and I reached out to you because I wanted to share their story because they are very important to me, um, even after they have passed on. And, um, I should mention they are both Asian elephants. Uh, they are both, uh, they were female Asian elephants that in my time with working with them were both geriatric at the time, um, so we lost Juno in early 2021, and we just lost Savannah um, this past January, at the very end of January. So, yeah, I reached out to you because I wanted to, to talk about them and my journey and experience with them, as well as a little bit of my experience here, here at El Paso as well. Yeah, I'm very excited to be having this conversation. I haven't had anyone from El Paso on yet, so uh, welcome, you know. Excited. I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so um, hearing your crazy Texas drawl, I can only assume that you are born and raised in El Paso, Texas, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was not born and raised in El Paso, Texas. I, how could you tell? No, uh, I was born and raised in a very, very tiny town. Um, I basically tell people it's pretty much a a village um, in Northeast Iowa. It's called Bernard, Iowa. Um, so I am Midwest born and raised, but I have been here in El Paso for almost seven years. Okay. Um, so I've picked up some of the, you know, the slang and mannerisms and stuff like that, but I definitely, definitely still have my rural Iowa accent that everybody <laughs> makes fun of me for. Amazing. And so uh, what's your story as far as getting into the field and all of that jazz? Yeah, so um, I don't know if my story is unique at all, but um, I, from listening to you talk about other keepers or talk with them, I noticed you um, said that a lot of them go into like the pre-vet route before they become zookeepers or, you know, they don't know that keeping is a thing that they can do um, until they find out like, hey, you can actually be a zookeeper. Um, my story's kind of similar to that. Um, when I was a kid, I grew up on a farm um, or in a really rural area. So I was always around animals and wildlife all the time, always bringing home stray animals and stuff like that that my parents hated. Um, <laughs> and then I actually, my ultimate goal as a kid was to basically be like a Jeff Corwin or Steve Irwin, like have my own TV show and talk about animals and ex travel the world and everything. Um, but going to zoos on vacations with families, my family hated it because I would spend hours and hours and hours at every single exhibit and you know just like want to read every sign and stare at the animals for forever so they they hated it um so when I was going to college like we talked about I didn't really know that zookeeping was a thing you could do so with my background, I assumed the only thing you could do if you wanted to work with animals was be a farmer or be a vet. Um, that's kind of what I thought the two options were. So I did pre-vet was what I started um, at Iowa State University, 
Um, and then I made it about a year before I discovered that zookeeping was a thing I could do with my degree. So, um, just with talking with, you know, advisors and, and other people was how I, how I found out that that was something I could do. And I was like, let's take this path a little bit. Um, cause I just, I didn't want to be the person that is, you know, only doing the medical side, but the animals, like nobody likes going to the doctor. Right. I didn't want to be the the person that the animals hate going to. So um, I did an animal ecology degree. Technically, my specialization is in pre-vet and wildlife care, um, but also with an emphasis in natural resource education um, or natural resource interpretation. So um, I'm a theater kid. So I love like talking and presenting and everything like that. So you know, getting a degree where I learned how to properly interpret nature to the public was awesome. Um, but I then um, just kind of volunteered at like the, there's actually a wildlife rehab center on campus. Um, it's connected with the Iowa State vet med school. Um, so I volunteered there a little bit, got a little bit more wildlife experience. And then um, I actually went to Africa for a couple of weeks. I went to Zimbabwe um, to volunteer at a wildlife sanctuary um, and worked with the native wildlife there, um, cleaning exhibits, doing exhibit maintenance. Um, it's a completely donation run facility. Um, it is, you know, it, it requires the help of a lot of volunteers. So we, I mean, we were helping them build enclosures for animals. We were, you know, feeding, doing all of it. Um, and being around all of those exotics was like what solidified for me. Like, this is the path I'm going to go down. And I used that experience to then get my first internship where I, um, interned for a summer. And then when I graduated, I interned at another facility where I was there interning for a year, um, first starting out as general animal care and then specialized in elephants and hoofstock. Um, just kind of fell in love with the elephants from the moment I walked into the building. And um, those keepers put a lot of trust in me and, um, you know, helped me really, really build my skills, which then I was going to say got me my job in El Paso, but in between then I did do a seasonal keeper position at, um, the Roosevelt Park Zoo in Minot, North Dakota for carnivores and primates, but I was only there for a couple months before I got the call to come down here. So I literally went from 50 miles South of the Canadian border to the Mexican border down here in El Paso. All um, right. <laughs> so yeah, that was my journey to get down here. And I started with area one right away when I got here to El Paso with these animals. And I have been here in the same area ever since. That's really cool. That is really cool. So what facility was it where you first got to work with elephants and like fell in love with them? Um, it was the Topeka zoo in Topeka, Kansas. Nice. Um, so at the time, they had an Asian elephant and an African elephant cohabiting together. Um, they were best friends. And I actually was there as they got two new girls in. They got two new elephants, so basically doubled the herd overnight. Um, and so I got to help them with that transition and, you know, just watching how they communicated with each other and also the relationship that the keepers had with with the older elephants, but also the new ones that they brought in. It just was, I, I've loved elephants ever since I was little, but that was what really was like, ah, this is, this is the animal that I want to work with for the rest of my life. That's really cool. You must be really excited that the AZA keeps recommitting to elephants every year. <sighs> you know, um, it's been a lot of like back and forth with, um, you know, kind of debating on what we want to have as like standards and everything like that for, for elephants and also trying to make the public perception, make the public happy as well, because we never want to um, 
at the end of the day, the public is what's most important to us and they are who we are trying to educate and make them care about these animals that we take care of. And so um, when we have people that want elephants to be in these bigger herds and bigger acreages of land and everything, um, you know, we, we take that to heart, right? Um, AZA as a whole really wants to make sure that we are listening and always learning. Um, and sometimes that means facilities have to get out of elephants. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it's a heavy, heavy thing to, to have to deal with, but, um, you know, it, it happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. I've enjoyed over the last couple of years seeing facilities decide to get out of elephants when they're not able to mm -hmm. properly give them the space and care, while also yeah. having other facilities like Cincinnati and Fort Worth commit to their elephants by expanding the habitats and making them, you know, way more impressive and stuff. In my mind, less facilities having elephants, but having more impressive for the elephants as well as the public um, habitats and stuff is a pretty good thing. But then I also think you have to consider things like, you know, you were talking about geriatric elephants and stuff like that. And like Buttonwood Park Zoo, where I went and played drums with Emily the elephant, um, that, that you know, they have two elephants right now and they're both super old and, and moving them would be really hard. And, and is there space, a space that should continue to have elephants? I think the answer is no. And it wouldn't shock me if that's the decision they make. But I also don't think it would be right to move the girls that are there right now for their own wealth fair so it's definitely a unique discussion but i do like that overall at the last two conferences the aza has specifically committed to their you know or recommitted to their their commitment to um having elephants as part of the overall collection and and you know making sure that you have a job and stuff <laughs> yeah as i mean it, you made a really good point in saying that um there are some of these facilities that have these geriatric animals that Maybe from a public perception, it looks like, oh, this, you know, there's only two of them. It's so sad. They need to be in big herds and, and everything like that. And it's hard to communicate to the public that sometimes you have elephants that don't get along with other elephants, just, just as humans, you know. I, I'm someone who doesn't get along with a lot of other humans, and I prefer my alone time. Um, and so there are a lot of elephants that are like that. Um, our two girls can, can be a really good example of that. Um, so when, after Juno passed and we just had Savannah, um, we did get a lot of, a lot of concern from the public with, you know, wondering why we had this elephant by herself and we had to, you know, it, it was a never ending battle of having to reassure them of she is getting everything that she needs from us. And it is, it would be way too risky to try to move her somewhere else because she is already significantly past her, her the typical lifespan of an elephant. And she also just didn't get along with other elephants. It's not that she was a bully. She just was fearful of other elephants and her past experience with, with other elephants that she had lived with wasn't so great. So she, I, the way that I would kind of explain to people is if you wanted to look for some physical signs that she was um, actually happy where she was at would be, and, and I don't want to attribute like, I don't want to anthropomorphize my, an animal, right? But for argument's sake, you know, saying that she's happy, um, they, a lot of times people will say that um, healthy cortisol levels in elephants leads to increased hair growth on them. Um, a lot of times you can tell that by the, the hair on their tails. Um, Savannah, in my first four, five years working with her, she had a completely naked tail. Um, and she was kind of patchy all over her body. Usually Asian elephants are these big fuzzy, fuzzy guys. Um, and it's kind of sad to say, but after Juno passed away, Savannah like exploded with hair and <laughs> she finally got tail hair. She, she put on a thousand pounds, wow. which, you know, was, was over time. It wasn't like an immediate thing, but she, she put on weight because she was no longer constantly stressed about is you know, is she going to get beaten up or, um, is she going to get her food stolen? Um, 
she being a geriatric elephant, you know, was harder for her to keep weight on. Um, and so just seeing how quickly she was able to kind of bulk up a little bit after she was by herself um, was really cool to see kind of an actual like physical change in her versus just telling the public like oh yeah she's happy she's she's fine where she's at you know like I can actually say no see look at this actual physical thing you can see on her um she also I mean she was getting attention from us 24 7 um pretty well not 24 7 but all the time we were there at the zoo right um but we went as far as we got her a 65 inch TV for the barn that I put my own Disney plus account on and she had her own profile and watched cartoons. Um, her favorites were finding Nemo, Moana and um, any like YouTube channel where it's like fish underwater scenes with like ambient music. Those were her favorite. Um, she would just, she would take all of her hay, pull it down and set it right in front of, of the stall and just like literally sit there and watch TV, like a toddler with, with their snacks, um, right in front of the TV. But, uh, just little things like that, where we knew that she, one, she wouldn't survive a trip being, being moved out. And then two, we knew that we were able to provide her with, the care that she needed at the time until until her eventual passing. Um, everybody on the team knows how to do elephant footwork, so everybody was, you know, always doing her pedicures and making sure her feet were as healthy as possible. Everybody knows how to do, you know, the basic medical stuff for her and blood draws, and she saw the vet once a, at least once a week. Like she, she was getting everything she needed. It was just a matter of trying to convince the public that, you know, she. She was okay where she was at mm-hmm. until until her passing, and she was immensely, immensely loved up up until you know until her final days. But um, yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's worth oh, yeah, mentioning. No, it's, it's, I, I hear you, but I think it's worth mentioning too. Like I think it was Vouter Stillard who said on my podcast that um, uh, training is the study of one animal. And I always think that is so important to remember because we can all go into our situations, whether we are talking about working with elephants or pinnipeds or our own dogs or like there are some facilities now that are working on training like cockroaches to do stuff. You know, it's, it's pretty impressive uh-huh. what can be done. And, and in all of those areas, um, it's very easy to say, well, this species needs X and this, you know, group of animals needs Y. But that is so reductive to me um, because Mm -hmm. we don't do that. I mean, yes, do all people need very basic things like food to survive? Yes, we do. We will starve without that. But beyond that is what's going to enrich you the same thing that's going to enrich me? Probably not, you know? Yeah. And and so I just think that getting to know the individual animals is something that zoos do so well that the anti zoo crowd or, you know, people who just have feelings about certain species like elephants don't necessarily grasp all the time. Um, An example that I always like to give is I think it's at the Tennessee Sanctuary. It might be at one in Florida, but um, they have a group of, of elephants that do like a like dance show almost every day. That's the best way I can put it, like a circus show. And I don't think there's an AZA facility out there that, uh, you know, like a zoo that has elephants that would allow that because it looks so performative. However, these are elephants that grew up doing that and that learned to enjoy it and that, you know, were showing signs of depression and stuff when they don't get to do it. So do we want to see elephants doing kick lines? Do we, did we want to see Savannah and Juno doing a kick line? No. I mean, maybe one time you secretly wish that you could. But no, that would be <laughs> not acceptable. But these elephants doing it, it's the best for them. You know, not every elephant's going to want to play the drums. But whatever happened in Emily's life where she gets enrichment from it led to an amazing moment with me. You know, I, I, there are no other no other elephant keepers were like, John, now come drum with my elephant because that could be very performative. But Emily loves it. So we're taking care of the individual. And I think people lose sight of that in the bigger picture of like, ah, we have to stop. Ah, you know, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we we struggled with that with our, we would do a noon demo, a noon demonstration every day um, with with one of the girls. We would flip-flop which girl did it every day, and we had to try and balance the, we want to give her the proper exercise and, you know, just keep doing all of the behaviors that that she knows, but at the same time, not make it look too, um, too performative, too much like where, um, you know, June, Juno's past was that she came from the circus. That was, that was her, um, former life. And we were always kind of afraid of people thinking we were trying to mimic that. And, you know, regardless of your, your viewpoint on circuses, you're, you're going to have the public, a lot of the public that doesn't like that. Um, and so we just had that constant balancing act of, okay, we want to give the girls their exercise. We need them to move their joints because they're, you know, they're geriatric. Savannah had arthritis. Like we got to keep moving girls, but at the same time, we don't want it to look too like we're trying to make her do tricks and, and all of that, you know, try and be like, okay, everything is medical. It's all for us to be able to look at from tip tippy top of her head all the way down to her toes, you know, and she's 8,000 pounds. So I need her to move for me because I, as a five foot five person cannot get her to move for me. Um, and so, you know, I need her to pick up her feet so I can look at the bottoms of them. I need her to step up on a stand so I can look at her belly. Um, Juno had his behavior where she would stretch out where she would basically stretch all four of her legs out and put her belly all the way on the ground. And it was a great stretch for her. Um, but from an outsider perspective, I could totally see how you see that and are like, it looks like you're forcing that elephant to do something she doesn't want to do. When in reality, you know, it's, it's exercise. It was getting her, her to move all her joints and everything, make sure she was staying limber. So, um, it, it's, I think being an elephant keeper, um, is, you know, all, all keepers, no matter your species, you're going to have those, issues and battles with the public, um, with, with public perception, with trying to make your facility, um, educate them as much as possible with, with the good that you are doing. Um, but I think keepers like elephant keepers, pinniped keepers, um, ape keepers have a special sort of challenge with that added pressure, um, for lack of a better term, um, you know, of the, they need more space. They need to be with more individuals. I know ape keepers always deal with people saying, well, they look sad, even though I'm like, well, no, that's their normal resting face. (laughs) Like they, they don't smile as, as to show that they're happy. Um, you know, it's, but we can't be out there like the, the entire day educating, um, especially someplace like the El Paso Zoo where we're a little bit smaller of a facility, we don't have the ability to stand out there and talk to the public as much as possible and, We can put something on a sign, but, you know, your average guest spends five minutes at, if that, at an exhibit. They're not going to sit there and read your sign. So The the most recent um, study that I found was seven seconds per exhibit. Oh, that hurts my heart. as an elephant keeper, you'll get longer than that because that also means the people that run away from the tarantulas and, you know, it's like an averages game. But it was Uh seven seconds. I know <laughs> my my inner child who spent hours at every exhibit is crying inside. Same here with my inner adult that does the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I'll, that too. My inner my inner adult also does that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it is really interesting, and it it goes to a really interesting place philosophically. But honestly, I hate to say it. But more and more, I'm kind of starting to reach the opinion that, like, we need to try, like, as conservation educators, as as zoo people, as whatever, we need to try to reach the people and explain ourselves with a certain group. But also, we're just living in times, and thanks to the internet and stuff right now, we're we're just they're, they're just there are people that you just can't reach, and yeah, I think absolutely. I've started to accept that and be okay with it which is something that i don't think i would have even said a year ago um yeah you know weirdly it it didn't even have to do with a lot of the zoo stuff although 
And there's obviously a lot of zoo stuff as well with this, but um, I'm just like a nerd and I have a lot of like nerd fandoms and the nerd fandom pages all have these comment sections that are like the most toxic things. I don't even follow them, but, but just see them because of the algorithm and like, there are some people that are just gone as far as I'm concerned, just their humanity has left the building and, you know, mm -hmm. or they're so convinced they're right and they live in a, a, you know, vacuum and they just hear what they want to hear 24 seven, that you could be the most perfect communicator and an incredible elephant keeper and explain everything you just did. And they'll be like, no. And that's as far as it goes. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what all their voices yeah. like sound like in my head, by the way. But um, <laughs> so I do I do agree that it is important to do that. But I also think that for our own mental health, it is important to simply say. And then there are the people that are just, you know, and it's probably not just elephants that they're freaking out about, but also other things that have nothing to do with the zoological facilities. And, you know, I, I've um, I mean, I, I had a person threaten me because of of playing the drums with, with with emily like to the point where i had to go to the police because i received death threats um wow yeah and it's like that person is just wrong and gone and like I, I, there, there are no words that i can say i don't care how good mm -hmm. i am at words and i'm not pretty good at words but um you yeah. know they yeah. need they need a lot more than that and so i do think it's important to both like you said work on it and do what you can and educate and be passionate and bring people in and i think every day you're having that effect just from how you're talking to me i can tell every day you have that effect on the public there but then there will also just be people there that are just it's not gonna happen you know yeah absolutely and it's definitely something that i am trying to learn for myself as well i that that whole thing of don't look at the comments don't look at the comments of every zoo social media posts especially the ones about deaths and and all of that um it there's always that voice in the back of my head that, that says don't don't read them don't read them you're just going to make yourself mad because you're not going to reply to them because there's too many of them and it's all it's going to do is just is just make you mad it's it's what is that saying where um it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You're just kind of poisoning <laughs> your own heart and mm -hmm. it's not affecting them at all. Um, so it's, it's definitely been a learning experience for me to, and, and I'm by no means there yet, but um, trying to understand that there's just some people you're not going to be able to reach and you have to learn to live with that. And my inner perfectionist is like, you know, my, my inner person that believes that everybody out there, there is some good in them and that they do truly want to, you know, believe is, is gotta, gotta, you know, understand that that's, that's not going to happen. The world's not perfect. Nope. Um, but we still so. do have to try. Like you said, we still have to try with, Absolutely. With, with, we just have to yeah. know when to, you know, when to step back for our own sake. Yeah, no, it's interesting with my zoo news episodes. I, uh, I frequently have to read comment sections because that is part of what I will report on and talk about. And I have done episodes that were like short term bad for my mental health. And I have done episodes where I'm prepping like at nine o'clock in the morning. Oh, that's a lie. I'm not even awake at nine o'clock in the morning at 11 o'clock <laughs> in the morning. And I will do some of it and I will stop and I will be like, well, my day. Nope, I can't. No, nope. And I will leave and I will go to the zoo or aquarium nearby or I will just go play with my dogs or play a video game or anything and then come back to it at mm -hmm. three, four, five o'clock, nine o'clock at night. And, and, you know, come in kind of girding my loins a little bit more and being like, okay, now, now we can do this. Um, cause yeah, no, there are times that I will just be sitting there and I'm like, here I am prepping for a podcast and I'm, I'm, I started the day in a great mood and I just ate my brekkie and I have my coffee and I'm very happy. And now I'm just sitting here hating the world and like fuming and like, you know, annoyed that my dog mm -hmm. is existing right now when that's not what should be happening. And yeah, so, right. so yeah, I, I have learned to deal with that, but there are times when I just delve into it all because I have to, and I'm just like, <laughs> I hope they realize yeah. this is a public service. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Exactly. Or when you when you get the people that are rude on, you know, a death announcement and I'm like, 
of all of the times to complain about the facility you're going to do, you, you, who is going to see these comments? It's going to be the keepers that cared about this animal. Yep. They are going to be the ones that see it. Not, you know, probably not the person who's actually responsible for whatever you're mad about. And you just, it, it makes me wonder like, where's your compassion? Where's your empathy, you know, for, mm-hmm. for the people that are grieving. But again, like you said, they're just some people, you just have to learn to let it go. Um, and then the people that you can reach, you know, you, you work your hardest to, to make them as excited as, as you can, you know, um, that was really something that was really, really special about, uh, Savannah was she was able to like basically light up an entire room whenever we did behind the scenes tours. She loved everyone. If you were a stranger, as long as you had a snack, you were her best friend at the moment, (laughs) um, she was just very, very personable. So like um, we would have groups of 20 zoo camp kids, you know, that were kindergarten to fifth grade and, you know, and they're rowdy and they're screaming and they're asking a million questions and stuff like that. And she just sits there patiently with her trunk out, like, I'll take a biscuit from you. I'll take a biscuit from you. Okay. Okay. And stands there patiently while everybody pets her side and, you know, freaks out about, you know, how she feels and everything. And then, I mean, we've, we've had people cry when they come back and meet her because, you know, they're like, oh my gosh, she's so beautiful or, oh, this is, you know, my dream. And just those are the moments that make it worth it. Those are the moments that make the sifting through all of the bad and the the toxicity and those bad comments, you know, from the public that those moments where you do reach someone and you see that light in their eyes, you know, you see just how they uh, get so excited about this animal that they didn't even know existed five minutes ago. That's, that's what makes it worth it. Um, And like I said, Savannah just had a really, really special way of doing that more than any animal I've, I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Um, She's just, she was awesome. That's amazing. So let's talk more about her. That's what we're here for. Anyway, I love getting all philosophical, but tell me about Savannah. (laughs) Well, Miss Savannah, um, I had several nicknames for her, Sav, Nana, Nan, Nanny, um, (laughs) you know, old lady, uh, just everything. I hardly ever called her Savannah unless I was yelling at her, you know, to come inside (laughs) or something. Um, But she was actually born in India. She is, um, she was old enough that she was from that time when they used to take animals from the wild. We don't know what her um, history is as far as like with her mom, like where her mom was, what happened to her mom. We have no idea. We just know that she arrived to the United States in 1954. Um, She was estimated to be two. We don't have obviously an exact birth date on her, but they're pretty sure she was too. Um, when I emailed you those pictures, I completely forgot to send you her baby picture. Oh my goodness. I can send it to you yes. afterwards. Um, it's actually, it is the background on my phone right now. Let me just clear all this away <laughs> so you can get a nice clear picture of the baby. Oh my goodness. What a baby. That is from the Dallas Zoo. The Dallas Zoo graced us with that picture. Um, So that is where she went to first when she got to the United States. She came with um, basically in a load with a bunch of other elephants at the time um, of various ages. We, I had gotten a picture from someone who is in charge of um, the record keeping for all the elephants everywhere. And he actually had a picture of, wasn't Savannah, but it was one of the elephants who came with her being loaded off of the ship by a crane like basically just a strap around her belly and her being lifted up and onto wherever they were putting her it was the 50s were crazy (laughs) (laughs) um but so yeah so she went to the dallas zoo in 1954 as a baby in that picture is a zookeeper pouring a bucket of water on her to give her a bath. Um, and he looks like a milkman. It, that is how old that picture is, is his zoo uniform looks like he's a milkman. Um, but it's really cute because in that picture, she's doing behaviors. Like you, you look at it and you know it's her based off of the looks, but also she's doing some behaviors in it that she still did up until, you know, 
70 plus years old. Um, but after living at Dallas for several decades, she moved to the Baton Rouge Zoo and she lived there until she was 45. And when she was 45, she moved to the El Paso Zoo um, because Baton Rouge, I believe, was going to become a breeding facility. So they moved her out and she came to us in 1997. So she had lived in El Paso since 1997 um, and had been there ever since. So she was already considered geriatric, I guess, by Asian elephant standards when she moved wow. to Texas. Yeah. So she's a Texas girl at heart, you know, being in Dallas and then coming back to El Paso. So she's she's a Southern girl. Um, (laughs) But she like I said, she lived with us from 1997 up until she passed um, at the end of January. So she at the time that she passed was 71, estimated 71 um, based off of what birthday you want to you want to go off of. according to the records and and people are going to dispute this obviously, but she was considered the oldest elephant with a recorded birth date at the time of her death or the oldest elephant in human care. Um, She was for sure the oldest in North America um, at the time of her death, but it's also said that she was, you know, just the oldest in human care with a recorded birth date. Um, So she was really, really special she, you know, was kind of the superstar of the zoo. Everybody called her the queen or the matriarch of the zoo. Every, I mean, people who don't even work with the animals, you know, knew and loved Savannah and would always want to come back and, and visit her and bring her treats. Um, she had a major, major sweet tooth. <laughs> um, so, you know, she's just like me. She loved donuts and cookies and cupcakes, which obviously that stuff was just saved for, you know, the, the special occasions. But um, every morning we would have to hide her meds in marshmallows <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> so we would, we would take the marshmallows um, and microwave them in a paper bag and put the pills in so that the marshmallows would be all like sticky and melted and stuff. And then pop the whole thing in her mouth because... Otherwise, she would pick the pills out Amazing. of the bag. Yes, yes. Um, she, yeah, she's, she had that major sweet tooth, but she also just was sweet in general. Like, she was an elephant that we had people from other facilities come and see her, and they were like, she is the, like, most patient, quietest, sweetest animal, like, elephant that they've ever been around. Um she also didn't show her age as as far as like her looks like she stayed looking quite young even up until her uh very very senior years um i always talk about her big old head she had the biggest <laughs> head <laughs> me the, the too biggest ears. <laughs> You would be amazed. I once had a teacher (laughs) in front of my entire uh, history class be like, wow, John, you have the largest head in the uh, entire uh, senior class. And I was like, thank you, sir. Oh, no. (laughs) That is super appreciated. I don't know how to take that. Thank you. And now I have body dysmorphia. I wonder why. Oh, no. Oh, no. You're like, dang it. How could he do this to me? Uh she in addition to her giant head she also had these huge huge eyes and in the the pictures i sent you you can probably tell like she's just got these big googly eyes and they were so just expressive and you know you could tell her mood just just based off of um just looking at them and they they were really beautiful golden color um i don't see that in elephants hardly ever wow. they usually have this you know like a darker brown uh, juno's eyes were this darker brown color and savannah's were this golden amber color that were just just gorgeous um but yeah they always looked like they were popping out of her head 24 7 um but that was just you know another one of her quirks that made her so awesome um gosh i obviously i could go on for days about her there, there was something you said to me about her in your email, though, that caught my attention, mm-hmm. is that you said she was more like a dog than an elephant. And I am so curious what you meant by that. 
Okay, so we liked to describe her as like the family Labrador, just like always wants to be in your face, in you, like with you, attention on her 24 um, seven. Everybody's her best friend. She, but you know, she has her people, but like if you're a guest in her barn, she's like, hi, best friend. Hello. Hello. How are you? Welcome to my barn. Would you like to see my toys? Um, just like, so just like vibrant and like, <laughs> again, a little bit dog-like. She liked to play fetch. Um, oh my goodness. Did. <laughs> we had a behavior for her, which it, it didn't have a purpose. We, we trained it initially to be able to like have her go fetch, like, um, you know, if a piece of trash blew into her exhibit, because we, we get a really, really windy season here where trash does blow into the exhibits. We could tell her to go get get it and she would bring it to us so then you know she wouldn't eat it because she again like the family labrador ate everything even things that she was not supposed to (laughs) so you always wanted to make sure that you got anything non-edible out of her exhibit before she got her hands on it if you know if she knew you weren't looking um but she also would carry toys in her mouth like a dog nice um so you know she she would occasionally carry things in her trunk like like a normal elephant but she had her favorite toy was we called it the donut toy i think they come from maybe wildlife toy box but they're basically like a hollow donut shape and then we cut a hole in it so that we could fill it with her pellets and then she would sit there and, and play with it and she would hold it on her trunk and then balance it on one leg and just sit there and bang it over and over and over again to get every last little piece of pellet out of it. But then when she was ready to come inside for the day, she would put it in her mouth and carry it in with her in her mouth like a little dog. Um, she had a love affair with a traffic cone at one point. Oh. Um, she she made a traffic cone her best friend for a couple weeks. She carried it with her everywhere. <laughs> um, again, put it in her mouth and just would walk around with it. I don't know if it was because, you know, it was a little bit softer, if it felt good on her teeth. I, I have no idea. But just randomly one day we um, had a traffic cone, like, come in with some enrichment stuff. And we're like, hey, it's brightly colored. Let's see if she, you know, plays with it or something. And she... It became her new best friend. We drew a face on it. We gave it a name. Uh, what was its name? Uh, <laughs> uh, it was just Coney. I knew um, it. I knew it. Or... I almost guessed Coney. Of course it was Coney. <laughs> what else would it be? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. But uh, she, <laughs> one night we looked at the cameras from overnight because we noticed that we had put the cone in the middle stall. And when we came in in the next morning, it was in the next stall over, and it was right next to the imprint that she left in the sand from where she had laid down the night before. Um, You know, up until her last few months of life, she had been still laying down to sleep every single night, um, which was incredible as a 70-year-old elephant. Like, that's wild. Um, But anyway, we (laughs) looked at the camera footage from the night before, and this girl picked up her cone, carried it over to the next stall, set it next to her while she ate some snacks, picked it back up, carried it over to her sand mound, set it down, gave it two little taps on the top of it with the end of her trunk, and then laid down next to it to sleep. Unbelievable. Like, I I, I don't understand. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure she had seen traffic cones before in the past, but for whatever reason, Coney was her best friend for like three weeks um, until she decided to rip it apart. And then we're like, <laughs> okay, no, we're taking this away from you. Uh, you guys got a divorce. Like uh, I'm taking this from you. Um, but I mean, like I said, I could go on and on for days about just how funny and just interesting she was. Um because she and Juno had completely opposite personalities. Um, and so she just, she was the the sweet and kind of quiet and everybody's best friend elephant. Um, while Juno was the, the one that you had to earn her trust. And, you know, she had a little bit of a harder life before that. So I don't blame her at all, you know, had a hard life. You know, girl, take as long as you need to trust new people. 
Um, and, you know, she was, uh, I don't want to label her as aggressive by any means, but she definitely would let you know when, you know, you were invading her space and stuff like that, or she didn't want you around. Um, while Savannah literally would come up and like ask for cuddles and like hold, hold my hand and, you know, want to like pull me in with her because she wants me to get closer. And I'm like, girly, no, we can't share the same space. Like you don't know how big you are. Um, her former keeper, so she used to be a free contact elephant um, back, you know, back in the day. Um, and her former keeper said that she would try and get so close to them when they were walking with her that she would like flat tire them. She would like step on the backs of their heels and like rip their shoes off because she was just trying to be <laughs> as close. She basically wanted to wear their skin. Like she wanted to be as close as possible to them. <laughs> Yeah, this is my dog, Flam. That one in particular literally will, like, try to crawl inside your mouth. I, it's, uh, she's so <laughs> needy. Yeah, it's no, I, and, and if she ever sees a hug happening, she starts barking and comes running because she has to be a part of it. No joke. So, yes, when you're saying all of this, oh I'm just like, oh, I have that. Only it's a, a mini Aussie <laughs> rather than a maxi elephant. So, yeah, that's uh -huh. pretty impressive. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, one, one more thing about her that makes her just, uh, I, I think about it and I'm like, you were crazy. Uh, she would, so the way that our, our barn would be set up is that we have an office and then there's like a big window and past the window is, um, the, the elephant stalls. Well, she could see us through that window. Um, and if she was in that middle stall and she could see us in there and knew that we were like in there having a meeting or whatever, basically taking too long to come back and give her attention, she would start like slamming door, any door that was like a little bit, you know, could she could make a little bit of noise with it. She was going to bang on it. She would take a toy and start hitting. She would find rocks and sit there and like... <laughs> it makes it sound like she was like a prisoner or something, but she was doing it on her own. She would come over to a gate and she would just ding, ding, <laughs> ding, ding on the, on the gate just to be like, Hey, um, I would like some love and attention, please. And you are taking too long to get here. Um, she just like, and she loved, loved, loved gossip. I don't know how this girl <laughs> could tell when you were like, you know, like, just gossiping or not necessarily gossiping, but like, you know, having a more serious conversation with your coworkers, like she would put her head out as far as she could go with her ears out as far. And she'd like stare at you. And like, you would turn and you look and you're like, um, you're not in this conversation, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> go, go do elephant things. This cheese man is not for you. Like go walk away, please. <laughs> She was just a character. She was so much fun. Uh, like I said, everybody in the zoo loved her. Um, her her past two birthdays, um, we made it like a zoo wide thing. Like it's it's Savannah's birthday because every birthday for her that she had was it was an accomplishment, right? Like it didn't even need to be like a big milestone birthday. It just was every year you've kept on living is is huge. Um, so it was amazing to see all these other keepers from other areas come together and like make presents for her like decorate boxes and like tie brows together to make little like they made like little brows hearts for her and little like paper flowers and pinatas and like all of this stuff that they would like hand deliver it to us and be like, Oh, it's for the queen's birthday. Like, and you know, they would write on it, like, we love you Savannah or the queen of the zoo from area five or, you know what? Like it was the coolest thing to see all of these people just love this animal that they kind of only know from afar, but they know how special she is and how just like how much she means, you know, to, to everybody, to the community, to the zoo as a whole. Like, like I said, she was, she was the queen. She was the queen of the zoo. Um, and, you know, without her here, there's definitely a very, very big void left behind without her. Yeah, I believe it. That sounds like, uh, well, that sounds incredible. Honestly, I, I wish I could have met her. 
Um, and I'm, I'm yeah. so thankful for you, uh, you know, sharing her story. Um, and of course, we also want to talk about Juno. And um, yes, yeah, yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about Juno's personality, and then we'll we'll get on to the the medical treatments. Oh, absolutely, yeah, Junebug. Um, she was our firecracker and our Spitfire. Um, like I said, she just was the elephant who was going to test you and you know make you really respect what elephants can do and what they are capable of up until, you know, you gained her trust. And obviously even then you're still, you're never going to get complacent, but um, she was like, no, I, you are new and I am not going to let you think that I trust you until I get to know you a little bit better. Um, And, you know, there were still some people up until the day that she passed that she still was not a big fan of. And, you know, she just, she had her people. Um, my boss was with her from the time that she got unloaded off the truck at El Paso up until the day that she passed. And they were like, they were like this, they were best friends. Um, she let him cuddle up on her in a way that she would never in a million years have let anybody else do. Um, and she was, uh, just like this incredible creature who, was one of the most intelligent animals I have ever met, um, that I've ever known. You know, she was able to figure out things that, like, were so impressive that it was almost terrifying, (laughs) in a way. Um, She did not like little like critters like little creatures i you know i don't like to say that oh elephants are afraid of mice or whatever but like any anything little she was just not a fan of um so you know you knew like a cat ran through like a stray cat ran through her yard if juno came trumpeting running around whatever um but what she really hated was pigeons and other birds because they would steal her food so juno figured out how to set pigeon traps what so th- this is what I'm talking about when she was so intelligent that it was scary. She would take her like brain that, you know, the pigeons were always after and she would scoop it into a little, she would take a bunch of it and scoop it into a little pile when it was all scattered out and put it in a little pile and just take a couple steps back and wait. And the pigeons would come in and they'd start eating, which is exactly what she wanted. And she would just sit there and she'd wait. And then while they were distracted, she would take her foot and she would hover over it. And then she'd basically play (laughs) whack-a-mole with pigeons. (laughs) And the amount of times we would come into the barn and find dead pigeons smeared across (laughs) the floor. (laughs) And I feel terrible because I'm like, these guys are just trying to like, you know, get their food or whatever. And they, they figured out that they get free food come to the elephant barn. But Juno was like, absolutely not. I will have none of that. And you will, you will regret coming into my barn. Um, (laughs) She had a partially paralyzed trunk. Um, We don't know exactly why it was um, paralyzed, but it worked at like the very top where it connected to her face. And then it worked at the very, very bottom, but that whole middle section did not work. Whoa. Okay. Um, Yeah, it was, uh, nerve damage and um, she had a big scar across the side of it and we don't know if that was related but you know it was potentially could have been um, she like I said she came to us from the circus and she came in 2002 so from at least 2002 or before 2002 on she had this paralyzed trunk um, but she had such dexterity with this trunk that only half worked that like I said so scary like she could pick up a tire and launch it like a little frisbee through cables you know at somebody she didn't like with like perfect precision (laughs) that was just like oh I don't know it's just I'm the more I talk about this I'm like oh my god that's so scary but at the same time I'm like it's so cool like just it's amazing like she Also, one time I watched her, there was a sparrow, like a little house sparrow flying, flooding around her face, and it was annoying her. She did not like it. And I watched her kind of swing her trunk out, pick this sparrow out of the air, like just snatch it, and then 
rip it apart in front of me <laughs> right afterwards <laughs> and then just kind of like discard it to the side um it, it makes her sound like she's like evil or whatever it just was like she's she had an efficient way of dealing with things that bothered her and yeah. i completely respect that like yeah, that's fair gosh if if i could you know get away with half that stuff right <laughs> but no not actually um but maybe a little but, <laughs> but a little. no she she just she adapted to this this disability that she had she found a way to um feed herself because she couldn't because of the the places that it was paralyzed she couldn't like lift it up like a normal elephant would she couldn't hold it aloft um and so what she would do instead is she would either like if she found food on the ground she would pick it up with with the end of her trunk and then just kind of toss it up like just kind of chuck it and then catch it in her mouth oh to my eat gosh it. isn't that cool or so she would cool. throw her trunk she would throw her trunk up and then like catch the end of it in her mouth so she was like getting a drink of water she'd suck up water throw the end of of, of it catch it in her mouth and then blast the water into her mouth just i you know, like, I mean, I guess if you've had time to figure out how to how to adapt, but just like, you know, a, an elephant in the wild who had an injury like that could potentially like starve to death if they don't figure out how to how to live with it. And she just was like, eh, I got this, guys. Don't worry. Um, we would still hang things up high for her. And all she would do was she would just kind of throw the trunk up and like hit like a hay bag or something and get the stuff to fall out of it. She just kind of knock it around and then stuff would fall on the ground and then she'd pick it up and throw it in her mouth um she had completely figured out how to how to you know be a, a regular old elephant even with with the challenges that that life threw at her um we always like to make fun of her for her short little back legs um i don't know how many elephant keepers you have talked to but i feel like a lot of us are able to just look at even just like a little corner of an ear and figure out which you know which elephant is in that picture or whatever because they might look the same to somebody else but to us i'm like oh my god they look nothing alike right like, right they're completely different um one of the things about juno that you could always pick out was the way that her back sloped down because she had these tiny tiny little back legs <laughs> they were so short and she had this chubby little belly that we just were never able to she just always had a chubby belly. Um, I've seen her baby pictures from when she was in the circus, and she also had the chubby little round belly. Like, that just, that was the way she was built. And uh, I think she was, I always call her beautiful and Savannah adorable. Um, they, they both hold equal weight in my mind. They just mean kind of different things. Juno was, you know, slender and um, had very, like, soulful eyes and everything like that well savannah was you know cute big head big ears big googly eyes like you know just ah, they were just both of them awesome 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 animals um, that is really incredible. and just to see yeah just to see how how juno uh came from a life that probably wasn't too kind to her beforehand and then came to El Paso where she was shown some love and some respect from the people that cared for her. It was crazy to see um, how transformed of an elephant she became. We, we heard stories about from when she was first um, in El Paso or from, from her previous days in the circus. And they actually had had her live with males when she was at the circus because she was she was more like a male in her behavior, um, more like a male in must kind of. Um, and so they would always put her with the males because she could hold her own, basically. Um, so she had a hard life before she came to us. And then, and then she came and, you know, she was, she was quite feisty in the beginning. And then she was shown a lot of love and appreciation and nothing but, you know, care and heart eyes every single day with her and she she transformed into a really really amazing amazing animal that you know it's been three three years already and I you know I still miss her just as much as you know after the day that she left so the day that she passed 
that's that's really beautiful. I love that. And um, you you mentioned that she had a particularly interesting medical condition. Can you talk about that and, and what y'all yeah. did? Yeah. Yeah. So um, Juno, gosh, like I said, she had that hard hard life when she came to us, um, and she finally was shown some love, and then the poor girl got cancer. Um, cancer is rare in elephants we think um it's it's hard to find a lot of times in elephants because you can't particularly do an mri on an elephant um so it's hard to find anything internally um so it, it may not be as rare as we think but but it is potentially quite rare um but she had she had breast cancer she was the first documented case of breast cancer in an elephant um and so she battled it for f- over four years, um, and we treated her with some really innovative treatment. Um, she was diagnosed with it actually before my time at El Paso, so my coworkers were the ones who got that devastating news. Um, they were the ones who found it. Um, I mean, I can't speak enough about how you know insanely incredible it is that they knew her so well to know when something was off about her and when to, to be like, Hey, let's, let's bring this up to vet staff and, you know, kind of see what's going on. Um, And actually how they noticed it was that she was spending a lot of time throwing dirt at her mammary, um, which, you know, elephants do throw dirt on themselves and stuff like that. But um, she was spending so much of her day doing that and, anything involving her trunk was more labor intensive because she had that partial paralyzation that spending that much time throwing dirt and food and hay and stuff at a particular area is something's off here. Like, why are you concentrating on that area so much? Um, And so they were able to, gosh, and this it's, it's incredible to even talk about um, my, my coworkers being able to, let her trust them enough that they could um, palpate that area. You know, I'm sure it was incredibly painful and everything like that. And then they were able to see, okay, there's a mass here. They did a biopsy of it and and turns out that it was cancer. Um, and so by the time I had started, she had actually already gone through one, I believe one standing sedation and one full full sedation, full anesthetized procedure before I had started. Um, But after I had started, we had done, I lost count of how many procedures we did with her. Um, We did some standing procedures, some standing biopsies, but we also did um, full, full knockdowns in our ERD. Um, Our ERD or elephant restraint device is a little bit unique. It's one of the only ones that rotates Um, so you can put an elephant fully on her side, um, and lay her down while she is asleep, as opposed to trying to get an elephant to lay down in a stall where she could potentially fall where you don't want her to, or, you know, um, all kinds of complications that can happen with that. Right. So you can lay an 8,000 pound animal on her side and lift, lift her up to a point where you have a whole team of people around her working like a little symphony, everybody with their jobs um, on on all ends and sides of her. Um, And then the other benefit of having this rotating ERD is that you can then get her back up onto her feet a lot easier as opposed to hoping she will stand back up on her own or having to use a crane or something like that. Um, so we were really, really fortunate that we, we had that at our facility. Um, from my understanding, ours was actually the prototype, the first one. And then the other ones that are in existence were kind of modeled after ours. Um, so it's really old. It was built when the, when the facility was built in, in the late nineties. Um, but it allowed us to do her electro chemotherapy treatments, which was, like I said, it was innovative. It had never been done in an elephant before. Um, her very first full knockdown electro chemo procedure is actually featured in, um, an episode on the national geographic. Um, 
I'm going to now blank on what the name is called. Animal ER is, okay. is the show. Nice. Um, and the, the episode, I believe, is called The Elephant in the Room or something like that. They've always got to be creative. I do the same stupid thing. Yeah. <laughs> my my best friend, Brittany, is going to kill me for not knowing the, the name <laughs> of it off the top of my head. Um, she's She is featured in that episode, so you can see how how impressive her bond with Juno is in, in that episode. Um, so that was recorded before I had ever started. Um, and you know, it, it's all tense because, you know, it's, it's for TV. We gotta, we gotta make it exciting, but it also was, um, a really insanely impressive procedure be- to, to have done because it had never been done before and, you know, it had never been done to her before. So they didn't know how it was going to go, if it was going to work, if she was going to wake up, if she was going to even go into the ERD, cause you had to get her in there in the first place. Um, but it, that uh episode does does feature the whole procedure and kind of talks about it um i highly recommend watching it you can see my best friend Brittany, you know being a little superstar in it um but she she had those electrochemo procedures um in the erd like i said fully anesthetized where basically they would open up the mammary um, they would open the skin because, you know, elephant skin is an inch thick in some places. Right. Um, so they would open it up. They would stick mm-hmm. electrodes into the tissue, basically into the tumor, and then shock it. Um, and by shocking it, that basically makes the cells of the tumor receptive to drugs, to medication. So then that way they could inject the chemotherapy directly into the tumor itself and it would be more receptive to the medication as opposed to putting chemo in an entire elephant and having to deal with you know the side effects of that the expense of that the you know everything that comes with with that you know um that's incredible isn't it incredible? It is. I, I have goosebumps talking about it right now. And, you know, like we did it so many times and it was, it, like I said, I described it as a symphony before we had everybody on the team had a job. And like I said, Juno was the smartest animal I've ever met. Um, so she would notice in her training if there was even the slightest thing that was different. So <clears throat> My friend Brittany was always her trainer, her always her primary for for every uh, procedure. And then we always had another coworker always on the controls. We had another coworker always on like the foot chains. Um, my job was usually being in the back of the ERD to attach another foot chain, and then I would scramble up to the top to throw belly straps over. Um, so all of that. In, a, in and of itself is a challenge because you have to coordinate with everybody to everybody has has to be there to do their job every single day and every single time you practice but also you have to try and convince one of the smartest animals in the world that it's okay you can come in here nothing bad's gonna happen to you we're just practicing um and the other challenging part of it was that not only did she have to come into the ERD but she had to walk fully through it turn around and come back through because the, the side we needed to access was the opposite side of where you could reach when she was coming in from one direction. Because of course it was. <laughs> because of course it was, right? Yeah. It was in her, it was in her right memory. And yeah. So um, it was, okay, do you know, we got to convince you to come in this way. And then we also got to convince you to come back in afterwards. And so basically we would do baby steps every single day multiple times a day only changing only tweaking the tiniest tiniest little thing hoping she wouldn't notice but she probably would notice to be quite honest with you and just doing it so many times a day that it it wasn't a trick but it was basically like hey I'm gonna convince you to come in here and you're gonna be okay and nothing's gonna happen so that when the time that it is actually going to happen you don't even it's just a regular old day for you um but I mean, she would notice things like one time we all showed up in the same shirts because we had made t-shirts for her treatment. We made pink breast cancer t-shirts 
and we all showed up. We're like, okay, we're going to wear our shirts on the procedure day. Like, it's going to be great. We'll take a group photo, you know, whatever. She would not come inside because she's like, <laughs> all of you are matching. Something's up. Something's fishy. I'm not going in. Ah, that is so funny. Like, she, uh, like, and it was like, dang it, you know, I love how smart you are, but I hate how smart you are. Like, and you know, it was just the ultimate test of, of patience and um, getting along with your coworkers because we were, everybody was pulling overtime, working seven days a week for months wow. leading up to every procedure because everybody had to be there every single day and practice, go through this, le- like, a, like a play, like a, like a musical, you know, everybody's got to be in their parts. You can't have one person missing because then the whole thing falls apart. Um, and then we also would bring in other people from other sections of the zoo to be like our strangers and they would pretend to be like vet staff or they would basically just be in the room so that when the actual day happened, she wouldn't be like, Oh, there's someone extra here. Like that's fishy. I'm not coming in. So we would every day be like, okay, can we get a couple volunteers to come? And people from every area of the zoo would always volunteer to come help us out, you know, just because they thought it was so cool to get to be part of it and to watch it happen. Um, And then when the actual procedures, the the procedure days would happen, everybody's really high stress and really, um, you know, worried about how it's going to go down, but you had to hide it because she could also pick up on your change in behavior and everything. So it was like, yeah. Yeah. Everybody relax. <laughs> it's, it's just act like it's a normal day. It's fine. Um, she got so uh, she started to pick up on the fact that if she was fasted the night before because it was a surgery, she's like, "Oh, next day is surgery day, so I'm not going to go in the ERD." So we had to practice fasting with her. So we would have oh, random days where we would pretend to fast her so that she would be like, "Okay, next day surgery day," and then when it wouldn't happen. She'd be like, oh, okay, so I guess when I'm fasted, that doesn't mean I'm having the surgery, but I'm still on to you. I'm still trying to figure (laughs) it out. Um, But like I said, it was the ultimate test of um, just just trust because with every procedure that happened, you know, she wakes up and is like, I'm in pain. I'm sore. You know, this sucked. And... Like, what did you guys do to me? And then we have to convince her to do it all over again a couple months later because, you know, with chemo, you have to keep doing it. Um, and so, like kids, you get, you take them to the, to the doctor and they get a shot. They're not going to want to go back to the doctor because right. they got a shot last time and it hurt. So it was, it's okay, Juno, we're, you know, come inside and we're going to take care of you. Nothing bad's going to happen to you. We promise we're going to do everything we can because this is you know this is for you um and uh she trusted us every single time she trusted us and she would come in and she would cooperate and she would just get love and and attention and um you know we took care of her every single time uh she had a tumor removal surgery as well which is probably one of the scarier ones uh, because the tumor had grown to a size where when they went to remove it, she would, basically they were like, it's a highly vascular area. She's going to lose so much blood, be prepared for her not to wake up essentially. Um, and so we full on said our goodbyes to her the wow. day before we were fully prepared for her to not wake up. And I feel like saying that as a keeper, um, you know, that's like, it's like, oh, you, you don't give your animal the benefit of the doubt. And I'm like, no, we, we thought she was going to wake up, but we also were fully prepared for her not to because we were told over and over and over again that she probably wasn't going to. Um, and so we, we banked blood ahead of time. Um, we banked some from her, but we also got lucky enough that Savannah's blood was a match for her. And so we also banked blood from Savannah and poor Savannah. She, every day she got a bag of blood pulled from her and she just stood there and she, she's like, I don't know that this is helping her, but I'll let you do it anyway. And we, uh, 
had all that blood banked ahead of time. We did this procedure. We ended up having to use a lot of the blood to, to do a transfusion because she did lose so much of it. Um, and she woke up and she got up and she, she pulled through. Um, she unfortunately, the, the cancer did come back and, and she did, uh, have a decreased quality of life to the point where it was time to say goodbye to her. But we did some really, really amazing things with her that I, like I said, I still get goosebumps talking about it. Like I, it was the coolest thing to be a part of. Um, it was something I am never going to forget. You know, I, I never want to go through it again. <laughs> but, fair, fair. Uh, but it was you know something that I will remember forever as the the scariest most traumatic most you know exhilarating you know time of my life um most challenging part of my life as well um and kind of along the same lines we were a little bit afraid we were going to have to do it all over again because towards the end of her life, Savannah was also diagnosed with cancer. Yes. Oh my uh, God. That's yes. So how, um, that's not even fair. Right. Is, isn't that just, ah, it's just the kicker. Um, we found out that she had skin cancer um, on her ear, on her left ear, because she had some, um, <laughs> For years and years and years, we always called them her crusty ears because she had these just these bumpies all over the edges of her ears. And she she's always had them. Um, but this past year, some of them were starting to like slough off and then become ulcerated and they, they just didn't look normal. So we were treating them for a little bit. And then our vets were like, hey, we're going to do a biopsy of these just just to check them out because they're not... They're not normal. And come to find out it, it was cancer and it was an aggressive form. Um, and so we were fully prepared to also have to treat her. Um, I was her primary for getting her into the ERD. That's one of my biggest training accomplishments in my career is Savannah didn't want to go into the ERD for years and years. We weren't really sure why. And just with time and patience and baby steps, I was able to get her to go in there. And I was like, okay, so she's, she's going to be able to be treated, you know, and everything like that. We can, we can do this if we have to. Um, and unfortunately it was her, we, we, unfortunately we never had to end up treating it because it was her arthritis is, is what led to her decline. Um, you know, quite quickly, she had dealt with arthritis for years and years and years. And the, the, the last couple months of her life, it had gotten really bad. Um, so we were doing like stem cell treatments and we were doing um, laser therapy and um, extra exercise and hydrotherapy and, and all of these things. But um, at the end of the day, it just, you know, it wasn't enough. So I luckily didn't have to go through treating another elephant for cancer. Um, but, you know, it's, huh. I don't know how to describe the gut punch that it was to hear from our vets that, hey, you your other elephant also has cancer. Um, especially in a species that, as far as we know, does not get cancer very often. Um, they were hoping to actually use a lot of the data that they got from Juno and from her treatments and everything to further that research as to find out why do they not get cancer very often or why do we not find it until after, you know, we do a necropsy afterwards um, and maybe even potentially help with like human or other species cancer treatments. Um, so it's, again, incredible to be a part of stuff like that, but, you know, at the same time, it's it it plays with your heart because mm -hmm. it's animals that you care about, um, and it's you know at the end of the day proud to be a part of it, but 
hope to never, ever, ever have to go through it again. That's fair. And that makes sense to me. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm, I'm curious, we have gone super long and I'm enjoying every second of it. So I appreciate your, your oh, I'm honesty. so sorry. No, no, I, I appreciate it. And we don't have like a set time limit on this. I just, uh, you know, want, want to make sure that you don't resent me afterwards for letting you blather all day. But, um, <laughs> but, um, I tend to do that. that's fair. That's fair. Me too. Um, but I do have, uh, one other question before we get to our, our little wrap mm-hmm. up, which is, um, sure. so you mentioned that you, you you know, love being an elephant keeper and that you want to do that for the rest of your life. And you also mentioned mm-hmm. that both of your elephants have now uh, shuffled off the mortal coil. And um, mm-hmm. so what is what is next as far as the, the program at the zoo? And then what is next for Beck? So we have already started to transition into our next chapter at the zoo. Um, actually, before Savannah even passed, we had already started to transition. We, we had already unfortunately learned that we were not going to continue with elephants. So we started the process of bringing in um, a greater one-horned rhino. So we brought in a seven-year-old male Taj from Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle, um, he is the biggest goofball in the whole entire world. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he lived kind of side by side with Savannah um, in her last uh, two months of life. Um, we were hoping it would be a little bit longer than that, that he would kind of give her an extra pep in her step maybe, but um, you know, it, it didn't work out that way. But He now lives in one of her old exhibits while we are also working on transitioning the other exhibit to be suitable for Indian rhinos as well. Um, And then the next plan is to become a breeding facility for for greater one horn rhinos. So uh, we're trying to get two females. Um, We have the space for it. We have, you know, we have the space that was built for elephants. Um, And so... It was not that hard of a transition, to be quite honest with you, is in terms of like facility wise. Um, but yeah, we already got one of our one of our newbies in, um, and we've had him since mid December, um, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, mid December. I went to Woodland Park Zoo to visit him a couple weeks before that to get to know him, and then and then he he came to us. So. Um, yeah, the next step is just kind of that transition of figuring out how to be a rhino keeper. Um, as of right now, El Paso is home. Um, my coworkers are my family. I've, you know, I've being so far from my family, I've, you know, had to kind of build my own here. Um, and I've been here for seven years and it's hard not to establish a life here. So as, as it stands right now, I am a rhino keeper. Um, in addition to the other animals in my area, I, I am an Indian rhino keeper, which is, you know, it's, it's been taking a lot of getting used to. It's a, it's a big change, not facility wise, but training wise, personality wise, medical wise, all of that. Um, but it helps that he is, like I said, he's a big old goofball. He's super sweet. Um, and we, we really do love him already. He's really hard not to love. So, um, he's, he's a big old doofus, but yeah. So that's, that's what's next for me, I guess. Very cool. I like that a lot. Uh, is there a conservation organization you'd like to give a shout out to? Yeah, um, you know, I thought about this for a little while, but honestly, I really wanted to shout out the Elephant Flying Squad. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with them at all, but we at the El Paso Zoo donated a lot to them. Um, Savannah was kind of the inspiration to start donating to them. They are a group of um, formerly wild elephants that have become uh, not not domesticated, but they live 24-7 with their mahouts that um, ride them through the jungles to patrol um, areas 
around villages and the forests in Indonesia, and basically they scare, they push wild elephants out of villages and everything like that, away from farmland to hopefully reduce that conflict between um, the pub or the the population there and the population of of wild elephants to hopefully um you know prevent any more elephants from from dying and being harmed because of that conflict right no that's really cool i've never heard of that that's that's really really neat yeah i i believe they are a, a a part of um wwf um, they're like a little sub- subsection of that, but we, uh, when we, whenever we donated, we made sure that it, that that's where it went to. Right, right. That's really cool. Yeah. It's time now, don't you know? We've come to the end of the show, but there's one tale left to go. You're gonna laugh and say, "Oh no!" It's time for the Rock Safari Poop Story. Again, also struggled with this one for a while, but I had to talk about um, the things that Savannah has eaten and then pooped out. Um, <laughs> because like I said earlier, she liked to eat things that she wasn't supposed to. And uh, listeners aren't going to be able to see this, but I brought something that had been found in her poop one time. Um, it is a child's shoe. Oh my gosh. Yes, it is. <laughs> It is like a little like uh it's an Oshkosh bagosh little like knockoff vans child's shoe. Um we joked, we're like, where's the rest of the kid? <laughs> like, <laughs> um we think what happened was that it fell off of a child into her moat and then she scooped it up and she ate it. Um but we have found I, one time I found an entire ratchet strap that she had pulled off of an enrichment toy and she pooped it back out with the hook still attached to it. Yes. And I'm like, Gir- girly, you are on the path to destruction. You are going to hurt yourself. <laughs> um, we had a blow up elephant toy that we put up for a holiday and we put it up on top of this huge wall and we're like, she's not going to be able to get it. Nope. She scaled a wall and pulled it down and ate the entire thing except for the battery pack. Amazing. Um, it's just the things we have found in that girl's poop. We, we actually have a whole shelf in the office that is um, trinkets of things we have found, mystery items in her poop. So that, that's my poop story. I like yeah. it. Now, you said that you're a, a big theater kid, so can can I have you yes. sing, a, sing a poop story for me like like I have people do sometimes where you just oh. go, poop story. God. Poop story. Nailed it. Perfect. Yay. <laughs> Love that so much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this, Beck. It's been a blast. Of course. Thank you for talking with me. Thank you for letting me gush about my girls. Yeah. Y'all, I loved those stories so much. And um, you could just hear the raw passion, uh, you know, coming out of Beck's voice every time they spoke. I, it was incredible. And I just, uh, I just want to go hang out with Savannah and Juno, but obviously that's not possible. Um, but, you know, the other thing that I have to say is, like, I've built a lot of relationships with a lot of people that have been on the podcast, and um, I don't know yet if if Beck and I will end up being the kind of off-the-air friends that I have made, uh, you know, at facilities all around the country doing this, but, like, I want to be, like, don't, you get inspired just listening to Beck and how awesome they are. Like, I just cannot, I don't know. I just, I, Beck, I know you're listening to this and I want to be your friend. So like message me more. Let's be buds. Um, there's just something about that passion and um, the, the open bookness and willing to share the, the joy and the sorrow and the challenges and the joy in the challenges and all of those things that just, this entire interview was so awesome. And, you know, we went 
an hour and a half, which is longer than I normally do. But uh, I I couldn't even believe it had been an hour. That that one just flew by for me. And and like I said, there's more. If you want to hear more from Beck, join the Patreon, patreon.com slash Safari, and you will be able to hear the patron bonus content. Speaking of the patrons of the podcast, I do want to say thank you to my Red Panda level patrons, Dr. Laura Shank, Dr. Stephen Williamson, Barbara Bennett, and Jenny Owens. Don't forget to be back here on Friday for Zoo News, y'all. And uh, hey, don't forget, the word credits backwards is Steiderk. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.